Welcome to the Filmlinks Podcast, a hand drawn podcast where we analyze all that goes into effective filmmaking. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Alex. And this is episode 129 Cartoon Saloon's Mostly Celtic Saga. That's right, we're finally going to talk about the true masters of the <laughs> uh, animation world um, at the moment, Oscars. Um, that that have Underdogs been every time they, they've been snubbed four times. That's yeah, Which, that's ridiculous. Out of uh, five, no, uh, no, that's just four. They've only made four feature films. So every that's single every movie, time. <laughs> every single movie they've made has been nominated for best animated picture and worthily. Um, which and and worthily, unlike ev- just everything that gets made by Pixar, just because that's the only thing people in live action who are the people who actually run the Oscars um, watch or know about offhand is Pixar uh, or, or Disney, which is just upsetting. But anyway, we're not really here to dwell on that over much. We're here to, to talk about uh, Cartoon Saloon, uh, which, uh, if you don't know, is an Irish animation studio. It was founded in 1999 by one Tom with two M's more. Um, with Nora two O's. T- Nora Toomey and Paul Young. They, they founded it in a, the, the Irish place, city, town of Kilkenny um, after the three graduated from Ballyfermont College, which is a very Irish sentence. Uh, but uh, I, I also want to point out before we get too far that Kilkenny is actually the location of Wolf Walkers um, later down the line, except mm-hmm. it, it, that was in 1650. And this is in 1999. Uh, They almost immediately started working on a trailer for Secret of Kells uh, to try to get it sold. Uh, But they didn't find any funding uh, for it until 2005, six years later. Um, Up until that point, they just worked on corporate pieces to make money. Um, And they also uh, worked on a variety of shorts, many of which survive to this day. I, I talk about that like it's forever ago, but they're they're just readily available <laughs> mostly. Uh, there's one or two that aren't uh, and are a little harder to find, uh, but I mm-hmm. was able to find each and every single one online in various locations. Yeah, we'll post links to a bunch of that stuff. Um, but I did find that interesting that the studio is kind of built on this idea of feature films and shorts going hand in hand, which is also something that we see in Pixar. And we covered Pixar forever ago on the podcast so you can go check out the toy story episode um what are our most popular that, episodes yeah uh and that's but that's so interesting that that these two like giants of the animation world that are so focused on storytelling also just use the short film medium as a way to kind of uh sharpen their teeth and and uh you know get ready for making the the bigger um live action pieces uh and it it works out really well. And we're going to be talking about some of the short films in our uh, bonus podcast episode. So we'll talk about all the Patreon stuff at the end. Just wanted to throw that in there. Of course. Um, but anyway, uh, they did eventually get uh, funding for that movie that would become The Secret of Kells. Um, and most of their work, and they've talked about this, uh, takes inspiration uh, from the uh, what's considered an unfinished masterpiece of animation, The Thief and the Cobbler as well as the Disney film Mulan, uh, which both uh, used native art styles uh, or native to the location in which the place, uh, the story was being told uh, to influence a 2D animation style for the film, uh, which is really cool. And they do that across all four of these films that we're going to mention, even though they only cover two locations, one of which is Ireland, one of which is Afghanistan, uh, which is a tricky one because uh, human depiction is not a thing in Islam. It's specifically outlawed. So that makes it a little tricky. Um, So they actually end up pulling a lot from uh, nearby Pakistan and India as well, which makes it really neat. Um, As well as going back farther to like pre-Islamic expansion, which is also pretty neat. Um, But anyway, uh, Secret of Kells was a huge success and nominated uh, for an Oscar right out of the gate. In fact, all four of their feature films have been nominated for Oscars. None of them have won Oscars, though. Um, and it eventually led to a deal with Netflix through which both The Breadwinner in 2017 and eventually their upcoming movie, uh, My Father's Dragon, uh, both of which are directed by Nora Toomey, um, will be released or have already been released. And in a lot of circles, uh, some of this is just, you know, 
uh, press being press, but they are often labeled uh, the Irish Studio uh, Ghibli, and sometimes they're referred to as the true uh, successors to uh, Studio Ghibli. I've seen some articles to that extent, but anyway, Jonathan, what are the in, in detail, what are the movies we are talking about today? All right. In uh, overview detail, <laughs> we're talking about The Secret of Kells from 2009. Uh, as Alex said, their first uh, feature. It was nominated for Best Animated Picture. Get used to that line. Uh, directed by Tom Moore and Nora Toomey. Uh, and then we'll be following that with The Song of the Sea from 2014. Also nominated for Best Animated Picture. Directed by Tom Moore. Uh, I'm seeing a pattern here. Uh, then the yep. breadwinner from 2017, uh, which was based on a novel, 2000 novel of the same name by Deborah Ellis. Um, and that was nominated for best picture directed by Nora Toomey. Uh, and finally, we're talking about the latest release wolf walkers from 2020 nominated for best animated picture, big surprise, uh, directed by Tom Moore and Ross Stewart. Mm -hmm. And almost all of these, I believe all four of them are, uh, produced by all three of the founders, um, and, uh, the breadwinner is executive produced by Angelina Jolie. Just throw oh, that out. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> executive producer is one of those titles where you never know how much it actually, like, it mostly means, means money was it mostly spent. means money. It, it can also a, a lot of times mean status. Um, yeah. so like if you have a major star in a movie, sometimes you give them an executive producer credit, um, not because they just want an executive producer credit. Because it, it doesn't mean anything, and everyone knows that um, it gives you it gives you money. <laughs> you, you get you get more money. You also can get take stuff like uh, best animated picture Oscars and claim that. All right. Without further ado, let's kick it off with the Secret of Kells from two thousand nine. Jason, take it away. The Secret of Kells from two thousand nine. In 9th century Ireland, at the height of the Viking Age, a collection of monks live at the Abbey of Kells under the guidance of Abbot Kellogg, who is obsessively building a wall around the place to keep out the Northmen raiders. Brendan is a brave young boy, the nephew to the abbot, and an apprentice to the scriptorium of the monastery, where books are copied out and illuminated, a detailed and skilled process of medieval illustration. There, the monks speak of the Book of Iona, worked on by the master illuminator, Brother Aiden, who has the power to turn darkness into light. When Aiden arrives with the book in tow ahead of Viking destruction, Brendan finds himself caught between his uncle's desire to protect him and his own growing skill and interest as an illuminator, with the hope of working on the famous book himself. Let's start talking about Brendan Gleeson, who is in more, more than one of the movies that we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe featured most prominently in this one as the uh, the abbot of uh of uncle yeah that the uncle and the abbot of the uh monastery at which holy crap he's Domo Gleason's father you didn't realize that nope i just did well there you go <laughs> it's a long line of the gleasons um yeah but the the abbot the uncle um is kind of, is something okay this is something i want to bring up for the whole episode so maybe it's worth bringing up now but a lot of these films revolve around this uh like hinge on an overprotective father figure that is brennan gleason's character in both secret of kells and song of the sea yeah yep that's it that's it um and in a way i you know it, it's it, there's a lot of family stuff worked in here and a lot of the times uh they they actually do a really good job of blending uh, this story that has is plot heavy and has all of this you know fantastical lore built into it, um, and even in this one, even though the Vikings were very real and they they did have a habit of uh, storming monasteries and killing everyone in it for the gold shiny things within, uh, they, <laughs> they're turned into like these mythical beasts as well to kind of go along with everything else uh, that happens yeah. in the movie. But but while they have all this you know, high concept fantasy going on. They also have this, um, this, uh, this less intense, like emotional storyline, uh, or sorry, less, um, less high concept, grand, grand emotional yeah. storyline paralleling that, that adventure. So people are going on these mythical journeys in order to not handle a theme, but handle, uh, essentially end up handling some kind of personal hardship. So in this one, you know, uh, it's about someone who's 
the uh, Brendan, which is ironic that Brendan is the <laughs> nephew of, of Brendan, the actor in this, but uh, it, telling the story of someone who's been way over sheltered, having to, and, and is essentially kept in the dark, literally kept in the dark in the cellar for his own protection at one point in the movie, uh, becoming, uh, breaking out of that and becoming like the bearer of light, becoming an illuminator, which I know that mm-hmm. they must have, uh, they must have picked that line specifically because that style of medieval uh, illustration is called illumination. Um, and it is well, really pretty. Yeah. I think, I think there's actually a lot of levels to that because they do call the, the book that they're working on the book that turns darkness to light. Um, and you know what the book of Kells is, right, Alex? It's a it's a it's a real book. It's it's one of the um, uh, it's one of the uh, isn't it one of the gospels or something? Yeah, I think it's all four of the gospels actually. Um, yeah, but it, yeah, it's the Bible which has a lot of that uh, imagery of darkness turning to light. Specifically, the it's Gospel the of John kind of starts off with that. So it's got that element, and it's got it's worked that theme throughout the whole artwork of the piece. I mean, we get the big epic battle, which completely takes place in like a mythical darkness, um, which is a, which is another really interesting thing that happens in both this film and Wolf Walkers is this kind of clash between uh, like a traditional kind of Christianity and uh, uh, the traditional Celtic mythology, which is something that happened culturally in Ireland uh, at the time that these stories were taking place is that that um, battle between Christianity and paganism or mythology uh, and those two different ideologies struggling. Yeah. And of course we spent all this time talking about all the themes, which are super cool and the setting, which is super cool, but we have to talk about the art style because the art style of cartoon saloon is so unique. Everything they do is in 2d. Everything they do is hand drawn um, and in fact, as they go along with each film, they uh, less and less, they, they show more and more of the process in the final product. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, I mean, in Wolf Walkers, like they leave a lot of like the sketch it's lines. sketched. Yeah. In. Yeah, which actually ends, lends a lot of energy to it. Um, a lot of it feels really flat. A lot of it is, uh, or compressed is the better word to say. A lot of it has mm-hmm. those like a uh, kind of just, I, I don't want to say lack of perspective, but kind of like this forced invented perspective that is exactly what you would see on like a medieval tapestry. Yep. Um, and it goes back yep. to what we were saying in the intro where we're talking about them borrowing from the native style in their case, Irish um, and like going back to Irish illumination, um, mm-hmm. Irish tapestry um, and other um, tapestry from medieval Europe to kind of create this style that is not as like smooth or, easy to look at as like a Pixar thing where it's expressive, but you almost like forget that you're watching animation sometimes. Um, but the entire, like, like the, the lines and the cracks show in this, you can see the process. It's, it's an expressionism very similar to like German expressionism, but this time it's Irish and it's animation. Yeah. And to just kind of like paint a picture of this, uh, through podcast, which is very difficult. Uh, But you can find, like, on the Cartoon Saloon website, they have uh, art stills from each of their films and various frames that kind of show off their style. Uh, But, like, in the Abbot's little cell at the top of his tower uh, where he can watch... It (laughs) kind of looks like Isengard, uh, where he can watch the construction of the wall around his his little monastery. Uh, It's a circular room, and he... It has, like, a dark brick around the whole thing and he's drawn on chalk around the whole thing and kind of drawn plans for the city but when we see it it's flat so it looks like he's standing in a circle uh with the town kind of laid out in a sketch format all around him like even though we can tell that we're like in a above angle kind of looking at him um and so yeah it's like that whole perspective is just completely compressed into like this flat almost like a net like if you think of in geometry when you take a shape and you unfold it and you can see all the sides at the same time, that's kind of what they do in a lot of these scenes, which is something that you almost can't do in live action at all without some like extreme stylization. Unless and this you're is doing an extreme like stylization. Style, like yeah. unfolding of reality. <laughs> right. uh, 
but yeah, I, I I like I like the way they just cop to it being animation. They're like, yes, this is animation, this is drawn, and you will know it as an audience, and we, we don't use, mind that you know it. We yeah. want you to enjoy it. And we're gonna use everything that affords to create these really interesting, beautiful frames. Like talk about every frame almost l- basically literally being a painting. Um, yeah. I mean, it's so beautiful. And the action's so cool. The way they do movement in this, and specifically in this one, in Secret of Kells, is amazing. A lot of the uh, a lot of the monks, all the adult monks, none of them have feet. They just hover. <laughs> they, yeah, they, and they, they glide. Just, they, they glide, glide across through the ground. The scene. Or, or the fact that like all of his buddy monks, like all of like the third character, the third person monks, um, all the monk NPCs, I should say, kind of like walk around together like they're one massive monk. Yeah, Almost, that's hilarious. In terms of movement, is really cool and really entertaining, and tells you a lot about their relationship. It also tells you, you know, just from a quick like audience perspective thing, like you, you it tells you to perceive them as a group because they are a group. Um, you yeah. don't really need to worry about each of them as individuals. You know, they have their little thing where they all kind of talk about all the different places they're from because um, monks tended to travel more than anyone else in the in the darkest part of the Middle Ages, mm-hmm. um, which is another like plot point as far as the the book of Kells traveling from monastery to monastery to escape the the Vikings. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love and I love the way they do the Vikings. The Vikings are really yeah. really really cool. Um they're, like they're not shadowy they're, monsters because they're because it's um a lot of what they do in this in uh, a lot of their work is tell the story very much from the perspective of the main character or characters experiencing it. And to the monks and to to Brendan, the uh, specifically the the Vikings aren't individuals. They're this dark, evil monster that's constantly on the horizon, coming to threat. Forward, yeah. Um, and like the one, the one piece of like really like expressive character we get from them is when they finally catch Brendan in the forest, and they only strip off the gold cover of the book because that's the only thing they're yeah. interested in, and that. That, that's actually kind of like a nice tidbit because that's very true. The only reason they raided monasteries is because monasteries tended to have donated riches and accumulated wealth of the communities through which they served because they were the closest thing to like a government for 400, 600 years there um, in, in most parts of Europe. So that's where, and they were relatively undefended as well, which you know made them perfect targets for Vikings. Um, so that's like the one, the one little piece of like actual expression we get from them that is kind of con- even slightly contrary to what Brendan might think of them, because he yeah. just thinks they want to come destroy everything, and then they just show up and take all the gold and leave. Um, but yeah, it's it's fascinating. It also has a really. What do you think about the like last third of this movie, Jonathan? Because the the time frame just gets stretched super fast. Yeah, so from from the point of the raid? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, okay, we're in spoiler territory now. They do get raided by the Vikings and um then Brendan has to flee with the uh the more experienced monk uh who has brought the book of Kells because they realize that Brendan is basically like an illumination prodigy. Uh and so they flee somewhere else so he can learn all the all the mastery of the trade and finish the book um and they literally do an exact pull from uh the lion king where they walk across like three panels of the frame and he grows up in each of the frames like in lion king when they're oh, walking yeah. across yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the oh, that's bridge. gotta be a direct pull too i mean <laughs> these guys really close. definitely love like disney especially classic disney the 2d yeah um so yeah i mean there's there is that where they just they compress time and they they show him growing up and then he comes back to see the village uh, as it is um, post post raid post destruction and then he he gets to make up with his uncle. Yeah, like on his. But he kind of he kind of comes back as like the enlightened Jedi who's like I know like I have understood the book now I understand illumination uh, and he's like he comes back as you know, kind of the, the chosen one in some, in some respect. Well, I mean, he's rocking that Jesus hair real hard when he comes back. Yeah. With his like robe. But that's the other thing is that he finds the abbot, his uncle in his little room and it's all dark and he like opens the shades and lets the light in. So like that theme goes through like start to finish in this movie. 
Oh yeah, no, they do a really good job of working their theme. It's it's really 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 well done. Uh, I, I mean, so, obviously everything's really put through. And if you think about it, if this came out in two thousand nine, and they got funding for it in two thousand six, and they started planning it in nineteen ninety nine. <laughs> uh, 10 years before time. it came out they had a lot lots and lots and lots of time to make this work so well so there's a character that we haven't talked about yet uh and that's uh aceling who is the oh yeah there's the like sprite, the, side the fairy s- character it's not really a side story it's like a challenge almost like it's like a mini quest kind of it's um well it's yeah it's part of brennan's like buildings roman is having another character that he relates to but yeah also and very to be much magical <laughs> in the irish folklore and they have to go get this uh this eye from this dark dark beast that represents the darkness and evil within irish uh he's like oh, the gosh, dark what was evil. the name of that thing it was so celtic it was it was so 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 celtic i can't remember it right now uh um, it's like Kumkula or something it was uh you know what? I, we we have the internet crum 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 yeah, Ram Kruak, um, who is who is a real deity in uh, in in Irish folklore. Oh, here's uh, a fun picture of Saint Patrick and Crom Cruach. Yeah, it seems to, if that that's there's not already, an Irish, the most Irish painting. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Saint Patrick apparently um, put an end to that. Um, but yeah, so there's uh, there's the scene where he he goes and he has to have this battle, um, and and the battle I saw described somewhere as like kind of harkening back to to the Beowulf. Um, it's like this underwater battle with this big monster, but the monster is like a sketch. The monster is like its own kind of illustration, and it kind of forms. It's so it's kind of a snake character, uh, and if you kind of imagine a snake almost forming into a Celtic knot, that's basically what ends up happening. Um, And Brendan is able to use a piece of chalk that he has with him to battle it. And that again is tying in all these themes of uh, illumination and artistry uh, and how art uh, is one of those things that can fight the darkness. And art is one of those things that brings light into our lives in all these various ways. Uh, And so that that was a, a really cool scene to watch uh, in this super mythological and and uh, it's it's a really exaggerated type of a style. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's it's like a uh, hyper played up. It's like an elevated style. It's so expressive. I also love that he like goes and like faces down this dark evil god, um, and then just kind of shows up back at the monastery like nothing else happened besides he found this gem. <laughs> He's just like, yeah, this is normal. Uh, he can't admit that he left the <laughs> monastery, so he kind of has to play it off. But it's still like, that was a big deal. Like, oh, yeah, oh, that's cool. But yeah, no, it's it's an amazing film. It's it's su- super expressive. It's um, very much an easy starter film for someone looking to get into uh, Cartoon Saloon. All of their films really are super ex- accessible. Not that they're like... I think the- I think super the only unapproachable. One, I only think the I think the only one that you should watch something else they've done first and then explore is maybe the breadwinner because the breadwinner yeah. it's really good but it's so heavy. Probably all three of the Celtic films and then breadwinner is a good is a pretty good order. Yeah, yeah. Probably the order yeah. we should cover them in, but we'll go so wait, in chronological we, order. We've always done chronological. There's no going back now. There's one time that we didn't. I feel when, like there's when, an exception to every almost when, every one of them. When was books. that? I think we covered Pride and Prejudice out of order because we wanted to cover the uh, more faithful adaptation first. Ah, uh, well, that's fair. Um, but that was like episode four, so too late now. We're going, and we should we should go. <laughs> we should move on to Song All of right. the Sea from 2014. Jason, take it away. Song of the Sea from 2014. Ben is the son of his father, Connor, a lighthouse keeper, and his mother, Brona. When his mother gives birth to his sister, she mysteriously vanishes, leaving Connor depressed and Ben carrying a deep grudge against his sister shaped from the grief of his lost mother. Ben's sister, Sersha, is mute and devoted to her brother despite his rudeness towards her. During a visit by their grandmother, Sersha finds this white coat passed down to her from her mother that her father had been hiding. She puts on the coat to discover that she and her mother before her are Selkies, a mystical creature part woman and part seal. 
After finding Sersha playing at the sea with seals, Granny decides that the lighthouse is no place for children and takes them away from a drunk and depressed Connor. But unbeknownst to the family, Sersha's use of the coat has revealed her presence to the world of the mystical beings in Ireland, a world very much in trouble and very much in need of the Selkie's help. But as a reluctant Ben and Sersha discover the world of fairies, they also discover sinister forces out after Sersha, and soon it's up to Ben to save the sister he resents on a journey through the fairy world, and to set both their troubles and the troubles of Ben's family to rights. Hey, Jonathan, did you, did you, know, you want to know what's crazy? What's crazy? Brendan Gleeson's in this movie. He is, and he plays the overprotective father figure he once does. again. He does. And this one, again, uh, I just... So I think one of my favorite things about Song of the Sea, besides that it just, you know, always makes me feel super big brothery. Uh, <laughs> it is, yeah. Yeah, especially if you have a little sister, which, you know, I have one, you have two. Um, Hopefully it doesn't make you feel super widowy, because that would be sad. That'd be very weird. Um, uh, but, yeah, they... I don't think any of our sisters are Selkies. I, at least I don't think so. Um, I could be wrong on that. I don't. I, I can't tell you with absolute certainty um, that yeah, that's not, to my not knowledge. true. I haven't had to go on an adventure to find any coats yet, so yeah. still waiting yeah. for that. We're, we're gonna we're gonna see what happens. Uh, but anyway, uh, one of the things that I love about the the Irish folklore in this one is just how perfectly and how intentionally it parallels the situation of their family and how it kind of, they never say it outright that like, oh, this giant who you, you talk about who cried so much that he was turned into an island by his, uh, by his mother um, in the sea is a parallel for the father. Um, it's, they're really they obvious do it through art, though. Like yeah, the, like the grandmother and the, and the owl. Like and the they, owl they have the same. same shape. Like there's a lot of very traditional um, animation techniques of using shapes to represent characters. Uh, so like the, the big strong, like uh, mythological God is very square and the, the mother mother figure is like a circle cause she's an owl and that plays into role. And then their grandmother is very owl, uh, very circular and owlish. Uh, even though they're not exactly the same character, they represent the same really? thing. Yeah. 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 For, for some of it, you can kind of keep yourself guessing as to whether what's happening on screen is really happening in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, at the end, it definitely is. Um, I also, I always like stories about siblings coming together, and I like that it's so clear in the, uh, in the movie that his resentment towards his sister is completely based in his grief for his mother. Um, yeah. It's... It's, it's just it's a really well built family dynamic and to to take that dynamic and expand it through the use of the Irish folklore is so so cool it's one of my favorite like uh, kind of like fairy magical creature worlds that I've seen mm -hmm. in a movie uh, although I will say as far as the family dynamic like they make the sister so sympathetic that you just really don't like the brother for a long time because he's so mean to her oh he's so mean to her He's so mean to her. Like the first thing uh, he does is like he kicks her off of a rock that he's sitting on. Oh, yeah, he's, no, like, oh, he's oh, real God. mean. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I uh, this is the second time I've seen this movie. And I think it was I, I don't I didn't hate him as much the second time because I kind of understood uh, yeah. more of what was going into it. And they definitely worked pretty hard to try to make him not super duper hateable. Sometimes that can be hard, though. Uh, when it comes to animation and that's that's one of those things you have so much control over uh what a character looks like and their design and you can even bring a voice actor in but sometimes sometimes you miss that special something that an actor can bring on yeah, screen. that uncanny valley like, some sometimes like there's something that an actor can bring on screen that makes them so damn likable that even when, or so damn charismatic, that even when that actor is playing someone who's like just a total asshat, you still like him. And, yeah. and, and so you, you can do a lot to mitigate, to, to try to do the same thing with animation. And you can do so much to craft characters, but there, there is, there is a limit there that we only, we can only get so much out of it. Um, and that's not to say that this movie doesn't work because of that. It's just to say that that same thing could have come off more powerfully um, 
played in a live action format with just the right, just the right. And I have to emphasize that. I can't emphasize that enough. Like, it's not like you can put any old little child actor in there and get that same effect of a likable big brother who's being a dick to his sister. You would have to find like the one in a million or one in a billion kid who could pull that off. Um, So if you're going to ask that just makes me think of that audition tape from E.T. Have you seen that one? Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. That clip is so good. But yeah, I mean, child actors are difficult. So that's yeah, it's a I lot mean, adult easier actors to get, are pretty hard to get too. it mostly there with animation. Than I can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it definitely it works. It works. It's not a bad thing that you don't like the brother. You're not supposed to like the brother picking on his sister for right. sure. And it's his character uh, arc. And he definitely becomes the big brother. much yeah. less of an asshole over the course of the movie. Yeah, um, which is good because he definitely I mean, he was dealing with stuff and he wasn't getting any support from his father and his grandmother. Well, oh, he, yeah, the dad she is, had she had like the, tears of unlikability in this movie. Yeah, like the grandmother, like had the kid's best interest in heart, but was not di- was not doing anything to actually help anybody. She was yeah. just being reactive and protective, which, again, they actually explore each and every one of those. Like the the man turns himself into an island to hide away from his pain or the, the mother tries to bottle up everyone's feelings and hide them away from their feelings rather than trying to process them. Um, and know, there's another kind of like subtler thing that goes along with that, which is this kind of transition from a very uh, like... I don't want to say like emotional because that sounds almost too uh, negative, but like this place of feeling that is connected with nature. And so that's like with the Selkie and obviously the whole turning into a seal thing. Uh, and but also like the lighthouse like, and the ocean. And then, yeah, that's the human world or, is or very gray the more and boring. Yeah. Urban slash industrial, uh, which is very like stone and stoic and, uh, you know, kind of, when they do that trip, they they spend a long time on the road trip from the lighthouse to the city and how the grandmother is spending a lot of time talking about how great the city is and all this kind of stuff. But then it just gets grayer and grayer and blockier and blockier. Um, and the whole point of the mythology section is that as she pulls emotion from people, they turn into stone and they turn uh, into these very just like obviously stoic and um hard characters and so there's that connection and dichotomy between like a an emotionless but safe kind of uh human built uh world and kind of the more risky but also freer world of nature and feeling and that kind of thing yeah no for sure and the hidden like glimpses of mythology that are still hidden without it like the, yeah. the fairies down the hole in the middle of the city. Oh, yeah. We got to talk about the fairies. I love what the fairies. What did you think about the fairies are, are the, the silly side characters. So in they, Disney, they, really are. they would have been like super played up and way dumber than they are. But they are. These are probably the silliest side characters of any of the cartoon saloon films. Um, so the but they're also a lot of fun and they they bring the music into it and that kind of thing. Uh so yeah, that was that was just an interesting thing to see in this one. Yeah, they bring a lot of fun. They bring a lot of mythology. I like that this one, you know, it's still in the in the Celtic trilogy and still exploring a lot of you know family issues through mythology. It's less uh, thematic on a grand scale like uh, uh, Kells is, and it's more personal. Um, but I like that they're still they're they're expanding the, the, their ambition in this one by a large yeah. degree. The, the plot gets way more complicated, and the, uh, the the range of things that they're depicting is also expanding dramatically. Um, I do want to talk about the Harry Fairy. I don't remember what his name <laughs> what his name is, but you know what I'm talking about. The Harry Fairy. The Harry Fairy. Who's the Harry Fairy? The fairy whose hair is covering this cave. Oh, the fairy with the with the memories. Yeah, I'm calling him the Harry Fairy. So he's he's. Uh, Brennan ends up at the the Harry Fairy's cave, and his his hair is memories, and so you pick up a strand and you can see them, but they're all fading because as the last Selkie uh, dies without her coat and her song, all the mythological creatures are also fading. Um, but that scene of his hair 
covering this whole um, cave and they like the the fairy like kind of pops in and out of the hair. He like just teleports through it uh, and then he uses it as like this portal. That entire scene is something that would have looked completely ridiculous in live action, but it oh, works sure. it and it actually looks like beautiful CGI. in animation. Yeah, it would need CGI and would have looked it would have been creepy. Probably pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, just, again, another example of like a really interesting scene that only works in this medium. Like it only works if you've got people who know what they're doing with their artistic style um, because on its face, like and and I can think of this in a lot of a lot of uh, fairy tales and mythology that we're probably more familiar with. So you think of um, like the the Grimm's fairy tales of the spinning the hay into gold and stuff like that. And, it you know, it sounds cool, but when you try to show it, it kind of just looks weird or something. Um, but it's again that that illustration is a way to show it that doesn't really work in real life because it just looks dumb. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a I mean, they take av- they take full advantage of uh, mm-hmm. of of the animation medium. I don't think this one does as like upfront in your face perspective as uh, a song of this as a uh, as Kells did, um, but it's definitely still incorporated into it. Um, they definitely go full perspective breaking in Wolf Walkers again, uh, but the way yep. they do it in Wolf Walkers is really cool. Um, but yeah, this is another good one. It's definitely a good es- escalation of like everything that they did in Kells, uh, but once more again, uh, doing it again in style and still again getting snubbed at the Oscars. Not that the Oscars actually count. It just makes me mean. <laughs> it just makes me angry whenever they. I see the Oscars be so terrible, which they consistently yeah. are. But you know, it it's just frustrating to 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 do that to see it happen again when it's like the only thing that non uh, cinephiles seem to put stock in. It's like ah, eh. it's just upsetting. Anyway, um, shall we move on to the breadwinner from twenty seventeen? Yeah, let's do it. All right, the breadwinner. Uh, <laughs> Jason, take it away. The Breadwinner from 2017. Parvana is a young girl living in Kabul under the rule of the Taliban. Her father was severely injured in the Soviet-Afghan war and could no longer work as a teacher, so he and Parvana sell goods by the side of the road as hawkers. They tell stories to help each other through the poverty and the heavy-handed anti-woman rule of the Taliban. After her father is arrested for insulting a Taliban soldier, the family is left without any male person to be the breadwinner. Parvana's younger brother, Zaki, is a baby. So Parvana, not wanting to see her family starve or her sister have to marry a stranger for their own provision, dresses as a boy and goes out to find work. The freedom she experiences is intoxicating, and she finds another female friend doing the same thing. The two have a good thing going, even though life is still hard. But Parvana wants to get her father out of prison. She sets to it, the whole time telling stories of a boy running on a quest to retrieve seeds from an evil elephant king as a way to keep her spirits up and to cope with the trauma of having lost her older brother. It's a race against time as war approaches Kabul and Parvana does everything she can to keep her family alive and together. All right, folks, let's let's feel sad. But also hopeful, but also sad. Um, yeah, this one, this one does not sugarcoat anything. Like yeah, it doesn't have the saddest ending in the world, but it's definitely not like a feel good movie. Yeah, everyone actually, well, not everyone, I guess, but all the main characters survive the movie. Um, mm-hmm. There's definitely a lot of trauma being dealt with in this movie, um, but it's much more present. Uh, it's much more recent than like you know the Viking raids. I mean, set in 2001 specifically. Yeah. Um, but it well, is. It, it is was written, very. The book violent. was written in 2000, so it must be a little bit earlier than that. Um, I'll, the, the, the clearest pinpoint I can give you is that the father was supposed to have lost his leg in the Soviet Afghanistan War. Um, okay. Which, if you're not familiar with that, it's like the USSR's Vietnam, basically, um, to, to put that into perspective. Um, but yeah, it's gotcha. about a f- the 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 family here has suffered through so much, um, and it would be so it would be something really difficult to sit through if we didn't have the same coping mechanism as an audience 
that our main character and our perspective character is also using as a coping me- mechanism throughout the film, which I think mm-hmm. is a really nice parallel. It's like, yeah, let's the, the character's using this to soften her experience in the world. And so the let's use it to soften the experience of the audience as well. Um, and to also do some really unique, interesting storytelling where um, our main character, Parvana, is telling the story about this boy who does not have a name at the start, um, who goes on this quest to rescue or to retrieve seeds from an evil elephant king. Um, yeah, to save and his slowly, you, you piece together and slowly discover over the course of the movie that this boy was her brother who died in an uh, explosion with an IED that he thought mm-hmm. was a toy and picked up and, and died. Uh, probably during the same war that um, her father lost his leg in. Um, and is yeah. also the same reason why she is also now stuck um, in this very dangerous situation where she's a woman in a, a world that is not very kind to women, having to pretend to be a boy uh, in order to keep her family from starving. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the, the stakes could not be higher in this movie. The yeah, emotional really. trauma is, uh, to use an understatement, rife. Um, the, the coping mechanisms are interesting. The, uh, the, the fact that they used kind of like this older style of story, it makes me think of like older, like Iranian style, or maybe like possibly like so, Pakistani or like Indian uh, style yeah, animation about, for the old there's story. There's a style switch. Yeah. When she goes from, you know, from the movie itself, which is fairly polished, especially in terms of yeah, uh, less extreme. some of the other films, like going to, um, wolf walkers and stuff but it's yeah, less it's expressive. kind of traditional animation and then when we get into her story it almost turns into this like kind of cut out like flat type of a thing like it almost looks like it could have all been made with um like construction paper or something uh which is it fun looks- and it feels kind of childlike uh but it's also really well like art directed at the same time it looks like something that you'd see on the wall of like a a ruin somewhere in like an yeah. uncharted game, um, which I, I think is the to intent. Pick. <laughs> you I have one hit to, to pick with the story. Uh, Where'd you get the, a knit? The story within the story. Um, okay, I'm about to tell you where I found it, um, and it, it's not a big deal. But they they built up this story. So the way that the 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 boy goes to um to defeat the elephant is he has to bring these three things and he gets them along the way. One is like a mirror that reflects uh, or shines. Uh, One is a net that ensnares. Um, And then the last one is supposed to be something that soothes. So as he gets each of these items, they have like an image that goes along with them or a color. So like the the shiny thing is blue, the net is green, and then the thing that soothes is yellow. But they never show the... When we get to it, the thing that soothes is is the story and kind of basically this idea of acceptance um, as part of the stages of grief. But there there's no like visual element to it when it comes to that. Uh, and they they had built up like the the blue mirror and then the green net and all this stuff. And then there was no yellow when he got to it. So that made me sad from a visual perspective. But it doesn't really detract from anything. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, That's my knit. There you go. It has been picked. Um, yeah, no, I really like this movie. It's, um, it's very well so, done. Alex, you brought up Mulan at the beginning of the podcast, and I think we can't really go off of this without talking about Mulan. Yeah, no, I, I definitely feel like this one pulls from Mulan, both in terms of color scheme, um, cause every, every movie very much has a very specific color scheme. Mulan has a lot of red. And this one has a mm-hmm. lot of red, um, you know, it's it's definitely set. Well, in also, something. just kind of in terms of the story, like you you kind of just think about it when you're thinking about a story of kind of a very. Um, oh yeah, I mean, uh, some, I'm going to use the word traditional to, society, uh, and yeah, she has to disguise herself as a male in order to protect her family or or do whatever. Obviously, the circumstances are pretty different, um, but you still just because that's another huge film in the same kind of genre it, parallels kind of jump out at you yeah yeah for sure um that actually makes a lot a lot a lot of sense yeah no this one's really good it's it's way harder hitting than anything else uh yeah. 
they've done, which is interesting. Um, it's really well done. They did a good job of incorporating Middle Eastern storytellers, uh, both into the cast and into the creative team. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, like you said, it's based on a book. Um, Although it's so interesting. Like, I, I just feel like the choice of story is so interesting um, for this studio, which, I mean, you can make stories about any part of the world, but also, like, the studio has such little um, canon to it at this point, and it's all, like, very deeply Celtic-based. And then they just jump all the way across the world and make this story that's not just happens to be set in Afghanistan, but like is set within the culture and like the culture is a huge aspect to it. Um, it's 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 so interesting and yet it's pulled off really well and with a lot of um, insight and sensitivity. Yeah. And I think I think a big part that helps there, too, is that the. Um, uh, is that the, the cultural clash kind of like presented in breadwinner is between um like these people who this family that held on to ideals that existed before the taliban kind of exploded and took over and the taliban itself which isn't really like a traditional culture really it's like a made-up idea of like this idealized radical past that yeah. is more regressive than anything else. And then this kind of does like a really good job of showing that another movie. Uh, like and it this shows a lot of a, like the characters uh, just kind of collaterally changing their mindset just by her interaction with them, which I think is a really nice touch. Like the guard um, has a super nice uh, character arc and he's not, I mean, he plays a big role, but he's not one of the kind of major players. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. And yeah. it, it's also interesting to see, like, just the the main family that we're following, uh, like, they they're following the rules, but they you could tell that they don't they're not that strict to them. So this is also kind of a break in some of the other cartoon saloon films, like when we're talking about the overprotective father figure, and you could see that easily being incorporated here, uh, like even with the mother once the father is taken captive, um, but it's not like the mom's like. Yep, this is what we got to do. And and the dad was always like had her out there at his stand. Yeah, um, they they 100 you know. percent like the, the family 100 percent doesn't like agree with the yeah. Taliban or with its the rulings. Culture, yeah, they're like, well, I guess they're in charge. We're freaking stuck. And they go along with it. But they also push back. I mean, the fact that he it, uh, talked back to a Taliban soldier is what got him in yeah. jail in the first place. Not even uh, mainly. He just <laughs> just was saying, hey, this is our situation. Like, hey, that dude here. was so trigger happy. Yeah, that dude was crazy. I mean, even that character too is is really well written. It's very clear that mm-hmm. that dude is freaking terrified, um, yeah. and has been told that he should do this, and this is your path to like I don't know power or whatever. Or yeah, he just has like a a budding god complex. Yeah, that too. That too. Like that's an easy way down the path. You can see how e- how easily he's just like a completely mis and dangerously misguided youth who was given a gun uh, yeah. and told that he was in charge of everyone else. And that's not a good mix. That's a very, very bad mix uh, yeah. as we see over the course of the movie. Um, but yeah, it's actually, it's handled really well. Um, I don't think there was really like any sort of big controversies that came out of like cultural representation, which is almost in this surprising, movie, which is, which is freaking impressive. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it doesn't sugarcoat things, but it's also like it's ba- it's pretty much making a statement uh, that I mean, I don't even know if they're allowed to watch it in Afghanistan. But I mean, if they did, they would not be happy about it. Uh, different parts, different parts. Back, or, or Afghanistan's a weird place, um, but it's it's it would be wrong to think about it as like a unified singular yeah. culture or even a u- single unified polity. It's typically a, uh, a a back and forth of control between. This is r- really an oversimplification, but between like the Afghan government and the Taliban and the other other terrorist groups. Um, so sometimes certain parts of the country are in control by are, are controlled by one group and sometimes by another, and it hasn't really not been changing since the Soviet Afghan war. Um, and it's continued to change all throughout the U.S. presence in the region as well. Um, although I believe the U.S. is leaving soon, it's definitely reduced its presence. But I think it's—I think the plan is to 
F- uh, to, to have most soldiers out soon. They've been saying that for years. I don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah. But anyway, this is a huge digression, and uh, you should go watch this movie. It's really good. Um, and it's not. It's definitely not, I wouldn't call it a fun watch, but it's a worthwhile watch. Yeah, and I think that's another thing, too, is like we, we talk about a lot how there are so many... Um, animators and animation studios and stuff and and the the big line is like we we don't make children's films we make good films that can be watched by children without a lot of caveats uh and this i think is cartoon saloon saying like the animation genre can be used for things that are that that go beyond like necessarily child friendly i don't think this is necessarily child unfriendly but it's definitely deeper. It's, it's definitely not like not your kids, kids not like your kids are going to be putting this on repeat on vacation or anything. <laughs> uh, or, or they might, so, but you might have to. Th- you have to a have concerning. a lot of conversations with them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think this is really uh, it's bold and it's really well done, um, and it's just one of those things that I think helps animation kind of get to a place where it can tell more of these stories uh, that are are less fun because sometimes animation is the best medium to tell those kinds of stories like it would be yeah. much more difficult to to tell this kind of story with this culture without you know basically just mocking up Afghanistan God, let so alone expensive. trying to get rights to go to Afghanistan and film it in person so and, yeah, and the, like the whole be a mess the the story she tells about the character who is her ends up being her brother takes up a good chunk of the movie too like it's mm-hmm. it's in like maybe an hour and a half long movie, and that part of the movie is at least thirty minutes worth of screen time. Yeah, I mean it could be its own short story. Oh, easily, easily, and you couldn't do like hardly any of that live action, and definitely not with the same impact. Yeah, it would have to be like a really highly stylized kind of fantasy thing that I think would kind of detract, or you would just go to animation for that portion of yeah, it. Yeah, and that would which, be like you're saying be is a, weirder is a huge portion of the it film would be anyway. Even weirder. Um, so, let's move on to Wolfwalkers from 2020. Hawu, Jason, take it away. Wolfwalkers from 2020. In Ireland, 1650, in the town of Kilkenny under English rule, the Lord Cromwell has ordered the woods to be cleared for more land. This puts the locals and the English soldiers at odds with the wolf pack that lives there and is said to be guided by powerful and mysterious wolfwalkers, those who can set their spirits free as wolves when they fall asleep. So the Lord Protector brings in Hunter Goodfellow, who brings his daughter Robin to Kilkenny with him. Goodfellow sets about hunting the wolves, who are frustrating his every move, while Robin sneaks out of the city, explicitly against instructions, to try and help him. In the woods, she is caught by one of her father's traps. While she's stuck hanging upside down by her ankle, a small red wolf approaches. The wolf is trying to cut the rope, but Robin panics and is bitten in the kerfuffle. That wolf turns out to be Meb, a young wolfwalker, which means that her bite has turned Robin into a wolfwalker as well. Meb is looking after her pack after her mother Maud mysteriously vanished in wolf form, leaving her unconscious body inert in the pack den. Robin finds herself becoming friends with Meb and suddenly against the Lord Protector and by extension and reluctantly, her father. The Lord Protector will stop at nothing to see the wolfwalkers and their pack destroyed and his will made absolute over Ireland. But things won't go according to plan if Robin and Meb have anything to say about it. All right, so Wolf Walkers didn't come out that long ago. Um, it's technically a 2020 release, although it didn't become widely available to the public until 2021. Um, and through various screenings and showings and reasons to watch this, I've seen this movie like four times this year. Um, Golly. But it's really, it's really, really good, and I don't mind it at all. It's, it's easily the most fun of the... Um, of the cartoon saloon movies. Like I would say hands down, it's, it's so fun. Uh, there's a lot of antics and side stories. Um, it feels like the most fleshed out of all through of all, all of them. I think this one's also the longest. Um, it's, it's really, it feels like a full animated feature in terms of like production and side stories and character development and timing and arcs. Like it's a, it's a full production. Um, and it really That's did not to deserve say that to win. It the doesn't Oscar. have any like darkness or, or no, no. Stakes it's, it's to a very because it, it does. It is. It is. It just also has a really like the second act where it's supposed to get really fun. It does genuinely get super fun. 
Um, yeah. The music's amazing. The uh, the art style is back on top at like its epitome of expressiveness with uh, these weird scenes where you can see like the entire uh, city in the distance, like it's yeah. vertically on a wall, which is is wacky, and you realize that's wacky, but it also makes for just like this excellent oh, composition. Amazing. Yeah, and it's not at all confusing. Um, they do this really cool thing where they decide to leave this the animation style really rough, and they consciously decided not to erase all the lines when they did their uh, finishing. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of scenes that have this really kind of like, the best thing I can think of is it feels like a grainier version of film as compared to super smooth digital, where you can kind of see like some grit and some work put into it. And it kind of almost like adds to the motion in a way uh, where it doesn't feel the- sloppy so much as it feels expressive, which is the whole thing behind uh, cartoon saloons animation style. Yeah, and and the thing that I kind of pulled away from that because the time where they amp up that that sketch quality is in the sequences where uh, either one of our our main Wolf Walker girls is in their wolf phase and they see the world in this rough sketch. Uh, everything is like blue, super and colored. It's, yeah, yeah, it's and then they you can see vision. colors through like the smells the scents. so yeah, yeah. It, they use color specifically everything is blue and then like a yellow drift will come in and that's the scent of something or an outline of something that they can hear with their hearing which is also an amazing way to uh kind of show senses that cinema is very poor at depicting um and it also just keeping it in that rough sketch uh format gives it a very primitive kind of a feel which is also the thematically ties in with the mythology and the getting back to nature. And again, that is a huge part of this because obviously it's again about kind of this, this human nature connection and blending and melding uh, and all that kind of stuff. And so using that really rough sketch kind of gives it that, that primitive kind of natural free flowing feel. There's also this like low key storyline in here that is n- not super explicit but it very much is you know screw the british uh, <laughs> which i understand i understand it's the british have done terrible things to ireland um it's, and over it's the more specific the, than that oh gosh i'm trying to remember what the guy's name is uh lord protector all over cromwell cromwell yeah who was like a a British hero, but was despised by the Irish. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of those. There's a lot yeah. of British heroes who were despised by the Irish. The Irish have been um, kind of colonized and still to a certain extent are, if you depending on what you consider Northern Ireland, which I'm not going to debate not on even too much because I don't want to get blown up territory uh, yeah. by a car bomb. Um, but but yeah, they've done some really dirty stuff to 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 Ireland. I mean, like the the Irish potato to potato famine, famine. You you hear about that, and you're told, oh, this is because there was a uh, fungus that destroyed a lot of the uh, potato crops, which is true to a certain extent. But there were still potatoes. Famines don't happen because there's not enough food for people to eat. Famines technically happen because there's not foods too expensive for poor people to eat, uh, because there's a scarcity of it because rich people hoard food. And that's exactly what happened, but the rich people weren't Irish. They were the uh, British people uh, ruling over Ireland, like Lord Oliver Cromwell in this movie, um, who they do, uh, spoiler alert, get dead by the end of this movie. <laughs> Although by his <laughs> it's true. By, by his own hand, which is a nice washing there. Well, that's, also, yeah. Sean Bean's in this, and he survives. Sean Bean does survive, just barely, um, by the skin of his fangs. Uh, but there, that, Sean that's Bean, the other Sean thing. Sean Bean's is, a good boy in this movie. <laughs> yes, he is. But the, uh, but the thing with Oliver Cromwell, um, dying by his own hand is also goes back to Secret of Kells. And again, that battle of, uh, religion and mythology, which becomes extremely explicit in this. Like the whole deal is like, God has told us to tame this land and to beat it into submission and blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, when he realizes that the 
the mythology is real, he chooses death over paganism and just like throws himself into the um, into the waterfall. Uh, so that that is the most explicit of this theme that has kind of started in um, The Secret of Kells and then just kind of they just glance over it in Song of the Sea. Kind of to an extent. Um, I don't know if that was so much the intent, so much as it was, it, it felt like Oliver Cromwell was trying to impose himself and his religion onto these people who were like, now nah, we're good. Uh, yeah. And that backfiring terribly. Yeah. Uh, especially when you do it with cannons. Uh, <laughs> cannons typically don't convert very well. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> Sometimes they do, but it's rare. Um, yeah. But yeah, but yeah, uh, Sean Bean does a wonderful job in this. Um, the leads, like the, the two uh, young female actors who play the leads are amazing. Um, one of which is uh, Honor Neefsey, who I only know because she was uh, in the Christmas Prince trilogy, which if you I don't... I love that you have to admit that you watched the Christian Prince trilogy. The Christmas uh, Prince I've yeah. watched one of them. I haven't watched all of them. And you, you know why, Jonathan? Why? Because they're, they're crap. <laughs> they're absolute crap. Um, but, but anyway, anyway. Um, yeah, no, this is definitely, this also feels like a, a movie that was very much meant for a much wider audience. Um, it, it was almost like they were expecting people to really watch this one in a way mm -hmm. like they, they had original music scored for it. We're running with the wolves tonight, um, which is a really dope song. Um, really good. Oh, scene. Yeah. I forgot that they, they had like a, a poppy song in there too. Yeah. Um, they had high, high profile cast. Um, it was released on Apple TV, um, which uh, again, not the best streaming service, but definitely a <laughs> higher profile one. Yeah. Um, Good movie selection, not a great TV sec selection, but it's hard to find a decent TV selection anywhere these days. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's a really, really, really good one. Of course, it's really good for anyone who owns a dog, especially if you own a dog that looks like a little wolf. Um, honestly, like when they're in wolf form, the the two main characters look like my dog and my dog's best friend. So I just imagine that that was what was happening the entire time I watched the movie. I was like, oh, it's Suki and Eva. Um, <laughs> there the, you entire, go. the entire Although, time. Why was the dad not like a giant white wolf, too, like the daughter? That well, we haven't seen we haven't seen the uh, we haven't we don't know anything about her mother. That's true. But I, I Although the, the mother she was the so mother distinctively got white as the as the yeah, the mother got very Disney. I feel like this one actually hits several of the kind of traditional Disney beats, um, it but it does, just does it with a being heavily nearly, Celtic. Spin. Yeah, it does it with more flavor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but story wise, we kind of we kind of go through a lot of the those progressions. So maybe that makes it one of the. More kind of approachable because the the story progression is fairly recognizable. Uh, I mean, even down to like the very last scene, that's just so feel goody. Um, but you don't even care at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Where they finally bring the the, the, the family mother back. All, yeah. Yeah. Comes together. Yeah. They'll curl um, in like a Celtic knot together. <laughs> yeah. And then they're right, they're on their their little like family wagon. Yeah. 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 They're the traveler wagon out to uh, the farther parts of Ireland. So I will say that this this film, it takes and we've already kind of mentioned this, but it takes some of those stylistic choices and it it builds on them and it makes them more extreme. So some of the things that I'm thinking of specifically are like you already mentioned the really flat foreground background thing, um, but they also do the uh, sectioning, the uh, kind of paneling of the screen. Yeah, they did a do lot. a lot of paneling in this one. It felt very graphic. Yeah, novel. which was cool for like when she's doing all of her her scullery made chores and yeah, or when she's sneaking in and out of the city. Panels. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other thing they do with Cromwell is that thing where he he just walks into frame or rides in usually on his horse, but 
then his face is taking up a quarter of the screen and he's just towering over the other characters. Uh, and that happens three or four times where he just like imposes himself into the frame and we only see like his mouth and like his shoulder uh, and that's it. Um, but it's just it's a really interesting kind of imposing way to do it. Uh, and then like the way that they draw all the horses, this one definitely felt the most like one of those old um, Renaissance murals that you sort of just watch from right to left or whatever. Uh, or one of the medieval story. tapestries. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, a lot of times it was presented literally in tapestry fashion, like the paneling that you were talking about, where you just read from one side to the other mm-hmm. to see what was going on. But of course, it was all animated. Um, and and that can be an easy like hole to fall down and suddenly everything becomes very confusing on screen. Too but much, clearly yeah. the artists the artists behind it were incredibly good with what they yeah, were they doing. Yeah, they have a good sense of they the nailed frame. it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um uh, All right, Jonathan, anything else to mention uh, about this film? Oh, I guess the last thing since we we were already touching on this is uh, I watched like one of the little behind the scenes things about this and they were talking about how the two characters, the two, uh, the the first Wolf Walker girl, uh, who is like, you know, strongly like she's the the Celtic mythology Maeve. pole. Maeve. Um, sorry, Maeve. Yes, Maeve. Uh, and then the English girl, Robin. Uh, Robin, who, who is who is drawn to look like a bird. I, I just want everyone to notice that her name is Robin. <laughs> yeah. and she's drawn to look like a bird. That's true. And then she she becomes a Wolf Walker, um, and. The, the whole story is kind of showing the the English and the Irish kind of coming together because there was such a tension there between the two. And so we do have the Cromwell character who is kind of realizing that he can't just completely take over the Irish uh, with his entire force, um, but it has to be more of a melding. And that's what the, the two characters, Robin and Maeve, uh, show on the other side of the story. Yeah, authoritarianism gets you nowhere. Yeah, you know, basically. maybe maybe mutual <laughs> respect will will will, will help. Um, but yeah, yeah, um, that's also not to say that the English should try to take over Ireland. Don't do that, um, whether by friendly or unfriendly means. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, stop it, just English. Be friendly. Just, just be friendly. Island. Yeah, just stay on your island. Stay on your island. We'll stay on our island. Stop taking all our potatoes, which is rich uh, coming from us Americans. So let's move on. <laughs> stay on your island. Um, all right, let's move to overall notes. Um, all right, yeah, definitely lots of uh, Oscar snubbing going on here. Um, I didn't look up all of the things they lost to. Um, I know Wolf Walkers lost to. Um, oh, what's it called? Uh, they lost to Soul. Um, okay. I know. I think Kells lost to Up. Kells lost to Up. Uh, one of them lost to Inside Out, I think. I'm seeing another trend. Which, of course, all these are good <laughs> Pixar movies. Yeah. They're, it's We're not, not crapping like on Pixar. We're just saying that they need to leave some room for the, the new guys. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying it feels like no one thinks when they vote for... Yeah for best animation picture. Uh, but I mean, with the uptick in cartoon saloons popularity, which I expect currently to only grow, um, hopefully just because of this podcast coming out in a few days. Yeah. Right? I mean, we're, we're really going to put them on another level with everyone who listens to the show Put them on the map. Yeah. 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 The, the, the tens of people who listen <laughs> to the show. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe, maybe they won't be doing that. Of course, that is to say, the Oscars don't really matter, um, and it, the the fact that one film won an Oscar over another it doesn't really mean anything. I think the first best picture winner was actually like a, a snub of of some kind. <laughs> I think, I think Those it was wings, right. Yeah, it was Wings versus like Howard Hawks's first picture, um, or uh, something Hawks like got that. Snubbed? Yeah, I think Hawks got snubbed in the first Oscars, if I recall correctly, which I might not. Um, huh. but, but yeah, well, definitely from like the earliest days of the Oscars, it's all about snubbing. I mean, it's, it is on its face idiotic to think there can be one movie that could be declared ultimately better than any other movie. And it's really ridiculous to think that any one movie in a year could be 
declared better than every other movie in that year. Um, that's not how movies work. That's not how art works. Um, typically the better way to judge something if you're interested in doing ratings is look assessing what something is trying to be or trying to do and then assessing how well they accomplished that. Um, and if you use that criteria, then something like Wolf Walkers is a, a five out of five every time. Um, All right, it knows Alex, what, it, what it wants to be and does it. I'm, I'm making a statement right now. I'm going to say that this is our last Oscars rant because I feel like we've had this rant many, many times. And so here's my proposal. We never rant about the Oscars and we stop talking about Oscar awards when we introduce yeah, we really should, we really we should. We need to find something We do. We, <laughs> we do, do it, we do it on else. everything. I don't know why we do it's, like, it's it doesn't really matter. It's an easy benchmark, but if yeah. we're going to hold up to this rant that has shown up like on so many of our Every podcasts, podcast. then we're just going to stop talking about the Oscars and we're going to stop mentioning what awards they've won and we're going to find yeah, some fair. other way to bring them up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to, we'll, we'll talk about people who've been in them. We really don't, we'll really only like maybe mention the director. We should probably mention more crew people uh, um, and more creative people involved in the process. We will now be reading the entire IMDb cast and crew list yes. uh, for each film. So it will be, expect it will be run a times. five hour long podcast. <laughs> Expect run times to expand. Um, no, but I, I, I mean, I agree. And I think that, you know, we shouldn't dwell on it. We just kind of, I mean, I think a lot of people use the Oscars where they just think about them. Like, what do people who know about movies think about movies? Like for the, God, the I always see people do Oscar person. parties too. That yeah. Just but I mean, nuts. it's really just like kind of getting together and being like, oh yeah, I saw that one or, oh, I didn't see that one. Maybe I should watch that one. But you know, it, it really doesn't mean anything. So it's, Let's talk about something else. Um, but yeah, I think these these films all like tie in really well. Like this is a studio that has a, a, a an identity, like a stylistic, they're, they're a kind visual, of like, a thematic identity. Yeah, it's it's very much like I mean, they're basically just a group of auteurs, really. Like yeah. instead of saying like one director's name, we're saying like these three people who have collectively come together and called themselves something. That is a it studio. almost feels like like watching another kind of Pixar come up because from what I can tell, it seems like a fairly small operation of people who have like the same vision, a similar cultural background for the most part, uh, and they have like stories to tell and a really really um, impressive way of telling those stories. And again, I think we we haven't even mentioned this, but I think on the podcast before I have complained about how little 2d animation is out there and uh, that it doesn't feel like animation. it's getting the right, like it's, it's just desserts because it's such a beautiful medium. And I think this, uh, aside from like studio Ghibli and stuff like that, which, you know, is, this is a kind of intermediate point to getting to more of that and getting that back into oh, the you popular mind mindset. You, it's just a different medium, right? Like it's it, it's wrong to think that. And there was this argument for a long time with some people that because three D technology was newer, that it was the future. Yeah, but, but it's that's almost not necessarily like how the case. Color has almost completely uh, eliminated black and white films, except for like really niche situations. Like I feel like they're two just two different ways to make film. And they're both equally valid and they have a lot to offer to various yeah. genres and stuff. But yeah. they're not given equal weight when making a decision. Most, And, and it's feel, all just marketing, right? More people are going to want to go see 3D or color movies than they're going to want to watch 2D or black and white movies. And I definitely I definitely feel like uh, one of the reasons why 3D animated movies are like considered, quote unquote, the standard when you get to big pictures um, is Pixar. Pixar's why. Yeah. And it's, they're, they're and it's impressive they what they did and what they were and they able to. they did a really to, good job. But it also yeah. means that everyone else, like Sony and DreamWorks, are just Pixar clones to a certain extent. Occasionally, those studios will put out something really good. But that's not because of their their the, their choice of animation style or their unique look. They're essentially just kind of doing a Pixar all over again. Yeah. Um, even down to the way like the character design happens um, or ends up looking. But... And maybe, maybe with hopefully with uh, uh, Wolf Walkers being so popular, I mean, there was an interview going around like everywhere, right? When it came out with Guillermo del Toro, who's a big cartoon saloon fan, 
um, with him oh, and Tom cool. Moore and uh, Russ. Uh, I can't remember the other director's name. It's like Russ Russell Stewart. Something. Russ Stewart. Um, that was really popular for a while, and I'm hoping I'm hoping that will become more popular. But one of the things that gives me hope for 2D is how <laughs> Guillermo del Toro teamed up with Cartoon Saloon. That would be a trippy movie. I well, I I could see it happening. Um, I could these, totally see it happening. So these these are only like the pure cartoon saloon features that we're talking about today right yeah there there are there's like four or five other features that they've worked on but didn't do completely solo um and those some of those are real wacky i don't know if you've seen moon man moon man's really good but it is a freaking trip um it's literally about the dude who lives in the moon who comes to earth and then he has to he has to try to get he he wants to interact with people uh, but then the guy who conquers the entire world tries to um, uh, trick him into bringing him back to the moon so he can conquer the moon, too. Um, but also there's this German scientist who Moon Man becomes friends with and also this little girl who helps him escape from the uh, the uh, evil dictator of the world. It's it's real weird. It, it is a it is a trip. All right. Uh, but it's really cool. One of the other things that gives me hope for 2D animation is that it's such a popular s- style for everything on TV. Um, and that's because it's 10 times faster to just draw something than it is to fully animate it in a 3D project. You know what uh, I thought of, which I don't know that there's any direct connection to this, but there there were a lot of like stylistic similarities that... Um, I kept thinking of like specifically between uh, the secret of Kells and Samurai Jack. Like there were a lot of um, similarities. Samurai Jack is amazing. Specifically the way that like the, the Vikings were looked very like Samurai Jack, bad guy, Aku kind of thing. Yeah. Aku, sorry, not Aku. That's the monkey from Aladdin. Um, (laughs) Very different. That'd be a very different show. Samurai Jack is so good, man. I still need, that's one of those shows that I will go watch. I don't want. I was telling Jonathan before we started the podcast that I, I kind of stopped watching live action TV because it just doesn't go anywhere. Um, and half the time they get canceled nowadays before they even even start to really tell a story because uh, it's a mess. But uh, cartoon TV, animated TV, I love. I love. I love. I love. I feel like the the uh, the creators get much more bandwidth because it's already out of the realm of what people consider quote normal. Um, and I Samurai Jack is something I need to go back and finish watching because it came out with some new seasons recently. I've never watched the original stuff in chronological order. And it's just yeah, it's I so cool. It's either. such a it's such a good show. We it's should so say dope to not deviate too much on this. Um, but Cartoon Saloon has worked on their own uh, TV series. I don't have a they full did, like they did look a into this. Foo. They did Skunk Fu. They did a show called Puff and Rock on uh, Nick Jr. and Netflix. They did a show called Ellie the Ace. Uh, a show called Dorg Van Dango. Uh, that wow, fun Nickelodeon what a name. Uh, and Viking School. Uh, Viking School on Disney Plus, uh, which is actually coming out this year or already came out this year. So they're still at it, but yeah, they're Cartoon Saloon is is building their repertoire they're building a uh canon of really good work uh across the feature film short film television uh spectrum and it's gonna be really cool yeah. to, to watch them grow wanna, and see yeah, how see that grow. influences the, the, rest of the other industry. work that's being done yeah. yeah yeah and it's and and to be very clear i'm not saying that i want all things that come out in the in animation to look like cartoon saloon no because I also don't want everything that comes out to look like Pixar, which is kind of what's happened now. I want there to be variety. <laughs> I, right, want there, that's the whole I don't thing. want I don't want there to be vanilla, uh, monotonous homogeneity, which is what Disney wants. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I want I want to see different stuff. I want to see people bring their own touch to each thing. I like. I like when I look at a piece of art or read a piece of art and I can tell that the person who made it has their own unique creative voice and their own unique style. Um, and it wasn't just a series of decisions that was approved upstairs with a rubber stamp um, that it comes, comes in the shape of a mouse. Yeah. 
Uh, Alex, just on a on a kind of a side note, I I want you to guess the number of employees that Pixar has and the number of employees that Cartoon Saloon has. Pixar has ten thousand employees. Oh, that's pretty close. And what's your guess for Cartoon Saloon? Cartoon I'm not going to give you a reference. Has seventy eight employees. <laughs> okay, you're a little low on that one. So Pixar has 1,233 employees as of 2020, and Cartoon Saloon has 300 employees as of 2020. Dang. I will, I will also tell you that I've, uh, in the not-too-distant past, I made friends with an, with an animator. Uh, and from what I've understood from what they've told me, the, uh, the, when you see like employee like, uh, lists like that, it's not super duper accurate because that's just permanent on staff employees. They uh, contract a lot. Yeah. So they contract a ton of stuff. That makes out. sense. Huh. But it's interesting just kind of to get an idea of like the core team. The, the scale. That's working yeah. on this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cartoon Saloon's so tiny comparatively. Yeah. But All they're right. making their way. They're doing their thing they're in Kilkenny. Making the way downtown. All right. Last today. thing before we, before we move on to what we're going to talk about next month. Uh, that I wanted to bring up is the trailer for Luca, uh, which seems like it's it's set in a very different part of the world, but a lot of the kind of mythology seems pretty similar. And also, just while we're talking about comparing Cartoon Saloon to Pixar, uh, Brave, because I think Wolf Walkers kind of redeems Brave from all the things that I didn't like about Brave that were very similar in Wolf there Walkers, so many but people done who didn't way like Brave. <laughs> Did you I'm like? I'm so Brave? surprised by that. Like, I didn't have anything against it. Like, it just felt like more Disney and Pixar to me. My main thing was that I never felt like she was brave at all in the whole movie. Like, she was just foolhardy the whole time. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. She never really ended up taking, like, a, she was never scared. And then, it seemed uh, yeah, like, and then by the, the end, the, it, the prerequisite to being brave is being scared. Right. And then by the end, her parents just let her off the hook of all the stuff that she didn't want to do and caused all the trouble for in the first place. And she never had to take responsibility. So it, I felt like it just fell flat on everything it was going for. Yeah, but, no, that's fair. OK, I see what you guys are saying. Um, but Luca, did you see the trailer for Luca? I've not seen the trailer for Luca. What, what is that? Where's that from? OK, so this is the new uh, Disney uh, Disney animation? At this point, I can't even tell if it's Disney animation or Disney Pixar. I think it's just Disney animation. Um, but it is about two boys in Spain, I think. Um, some little like uh, seaside town. And they're like these water monsters, water creatures. But only when they're wet, they turn into their little flippery merboy selves. Uh, and then they're just normal boys, kind of like street rat scamps um the rest of the time uh but the town is like super against rat (laughs) but the town is super against the the water monsters and they have all these statues of like killing sea monsters and stuff so it's kind of a similar thing to uh wolf walkers where they're these shapeshifters that are being hunted by the humans but they don't know that they're the shapeshifters so they have to keep avoiding it so i'll be very interested to see how like that film shapes up in comparison Huh. Yeah, I'm watching it right now. Yeah, and this will be interesting. I mean, again, it's very Disney, very Pixar. Yeah. Wait, um, who's doing right. this? Oh, this is Pixar. Oh, is it Pixar? All right. Yeah, it's, it's full Pixar. Bold choice. Yeah. All right. Pixar's I'll be, getting I'll be very here. fantasy-y lately. Um, okay, so Alex... Next time, we're going on a bit of an adventure, uh, still across the pond a bit, uh, but more south. What are we talking about next time? Next time, we're going to talk about Jacques Cousteau and his yes, Life Aquatique. <laughs> Basically. Partially inspired by my favorite movie ever, The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou, which is, in fact, actually, the, the choice was inspired by that. But it was... Yeah, uh, Jacques Cousteau was, was yeah, a little... Yeah, no, that came predates. much afterwards. Bill Murray's playing Jacques Cousteau in that movie. Uh, but American, because um, Bill Murray uh, doesn't do do accents. Um, Jacques Cousteau might have been sad. I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, it's true. He also likes blowing up fish, apparently. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> that's what we're that. going to be getting into. <laughs> that's what we'll be, we'll be exploring later as they explore the underwater world. Um, so 
the we're going to talk about uh, some let, movies let me that just he preface did. For I mean, apparently everyone, our parents' generation already knows this, but for anyone who may not know, Jacques Cousteau was a very famous uh, undersea uh, explorer. Uh, and documentarian. Documentarian, biologist, all that kind of stuff. And TV he star. Some, yeah, and he was kind of the uh, Steve Irwin of his day, um, still with a fun accent. Are um, you saying that also, because of the epic rap battle? Uh, I am. I'm trying to give a, a um, Here to spit touch yo. point. If it's uh, it's but Cuba, he, <laughs> Captain the Calypso. Uh, but yeah, he... Uh, uh, he was what much much less um, environmentally conscious than we are now. So that's going to be fun to learning. talk about the evolution of uh, ecology and and environmentalism. So some of it we will say they were learning, and some of it we will say, yeah, you, there's no excuse for bashing sharks to death with a sledgehammer. Uh, but or C4 we'll explain coral what reef. that. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll talk about that uh, in more depth next week, next month. Uh, but. but but, uh, so Jacques Cousteau had like six or seven TV series uh, that were more or less in and of themselves, like just really long documentaries that aired over the course of like a couple of years. Uh, but uh, those are really long. So we're going to talk about his movies instead, which are the, the first two are How He Got Famous. And then uh, the last one we're going to talk about uh, that is his documentary, uh, is kind of like bookending his uh, time in the sun. Uh, it also came very close to the the end of his life. Um, and then the last movie we're going to talk about is actually just a biopic about Jacques Cousteau, which is going to help kind of flesh out some of the biography details and explain a little bit more about the person uh, of who Jacques Cousteau is. Of course, I would also recommend watching The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou by Wes Anderson. Yep, um, but the, which we've uh, already the, covered. But the uh, specifically the four films we're going to talk about are The Silent World from 1956, which is uh, Jacques Cousteau on his boat, uh, kind of exploring some underwater stuff, um, but also a lot of above water stuff, just kind of like what his crew does in general. And then we're going to talk about World Without Sun from 1964, which is really interesting because it takes place mostly in and around the on the seafloor base that Jacques Cousteau made. Um, along with his crew. Uh, and yes, it is really all that yellow. And yes, there is a little yellow submarine. Um, nice. <laughs> which might was probably the origin of that song. song, um, Probably because yellow shows up so well underwater. But it, uh, it, it will be a much more produced, in-depth look, pun intended, uh, at the uh, the world without sun beneath the ocean floor and everything that the uh, explorers have to do to kind of survive down there and do their research. Um, there's much more science in that one too and less explosives. Um, and then we're going to talk about Voyage to the Edge of the World, which I haven't seen yet, but is mostly set in the Arctic, um, which should be fascinating. I think there's a lot of seals in it, um, which is a scene directly rift on in the life aquatic with steve zisu um, and then we're going to talk about the biopic which is the odyssey from 2016 not that long ago which comes out of the film grant world of europe yep uh and if you would like to support us uh in the meantime you can do that we have a patreon uh and over there you can join our digital community uh you can always join us over on discord but if you join the patreon you can also hear us record these episodes live um and you can join us for the movie nights and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and also on the Patreon, you have the bonus podcast. And the last bonus podcast that we talked about was um, one of Ernst Lubitsch's uh, silent films that came out 100 years ago uh, called The Wildcat. That was from his uh, German period. Uh, so that was crazy. A lot of fun. Uh, and next time we're actually going to be talking about more Cartoon Saloon. Uh, and that will be kind of covering some of their short films and, and stuff like that. So if you want more, then go check out the Patreon. Definitely do. Well, that's about all the time we have for this episode. If you have movie suggestions for us or just want to reach out, I can be found on Twitter at, at JS Satchel. And I'm at Alex Garinger. And I'm at the Blue Jay 1994. And to find links to things that we talked about today, you can view them on the blog at thefilmlinks.com. If you like the show, let us know. Leave us a review on iTunes so other people will know what we're all about. We definitely appreciate it. Talk to you next time. All right, see ya. Wow.
walking fast. Faces pass and they're 2D. Da, 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 da. You have to take that out now because that's copyrighted. Um, <laughs> I don't think they're going to complain about that particular or, rendition. You, you don't think Alicia Keys <laughs> is going to come after us? I think we'll be all right. I think we'll be okay. all right. Okay. Honestly, if she Keys, does, that would be, be the best Brothers PR music. we've ever had. That would be amazing. Please come after us, Alicia Keys. Um, I hope I also didn't get that wrong. Is it Alicia Keys who's, who sings that? I have no clue. Wrong guy to have. Alicia Keys making sorry that was vanessa carlton well now they're gonna be both be mad at us and it'll be even better for us womp womp 